So multiple linear regression is a, a, a very useful statistical analysis we can use to predict a y value based on a set of known x values. Excuse me, an, an unknown y value based on a set of known x values. The idea is we can first train a model by calculating a set of coefficients uh, applied to a set of x or input variables, which then uh, we can use to predict future values of y. Let me show you exactly what I mean. Download this data right here, bike buyers formatted data. We've been using this in, in earlier examples. Go ahead and, and get that, open it up, and let's practice with linear regression. So once it's open, I want you to go to the numeric tab where, as you might remember, I've changed a bunch of the uh, categorical text-based variables in the set of bike buyers data to uh, numeric variables. Let me try and get this all on one page so you can see everything at once here. On one screen, excuse me. So again, each row represents someone who's come into our bike store and they either did or did not purchase a bike from us. We also know a set of demographic information about them, their marital status, gender, income, children, education, age, whether or not they purchased a home, uh, and other stuff like that. Some of these you'll notice are repeated. If this is your first video you've watched. I've changed values like male and female to numeric values so that we can run these analyses on them. So in Excel, I want you to go to data, data analysis, and let's select regression down here on the list. There are many types of regression used in data mining and uh, predicting the future. In Excel, this is uh, allows us to perform what's called multiple linear regression. Linear, uh, well, actually, I'll just wait and explain it as we do it. So select regression, hit OK, and it says, OK, we want you to input a Y value. We need to specify very clearly what the dependent variable or output variable is. In this case, if I'm a bike store on, owner, I want to predict who's going to purchase a bike in the future. So click this box, and I'm going to go to the purchase bike column, not this categorical one here with the yes, no value. It has to be numeric data. So I've made this version of the same data. Select that, control shift down, enter. Uh, and instead of a, a one, instead of a yes, it's a one and a zero for no. Input X range. Now, the nice thing about linear regression, unlike the simple one-way ANOVA as we taught you earlier, is here I can have a set of x values or independent variables. And unlike a simple correlation where I look at pairs of variables that are correlated to each other, each one of these x variables is going to control for or account or remove the variance due to all the other variables. So I'll show you what I mean. Click on this box. Let's scroll to the top. Let's select marital status right over to home ownership leaving off purchase bike, control shift down, enter. I want you, to, of course, we included labels when we selected that, so check labels. For now, we're going to leave these alone. We're also going to leave these alone down here. I just want you to click output range, click this box, and let's select where the output will appear. Let's scroll over here and put it somewhere around U2. Enter, okay. So it's given us a bunch of information. Let's discuss what it all means. For uh, this class or this tutorial, I want you to ignore everything here except for R squared. Ideally, you've already learned uh, the formula for R, our correlation, the Pearson correlation coefficient. R squared is that correlation coefficient squared. The idea is no longer do we have a variable or a range between uh, negative 1 and 1. Once you square a negative value, it becomes positive. So now all of our R, R squared values are going to be between 0 and 1. We can convert this to a percent, which is usually how we um, interpret it. Let me give some decimal places here. What this number represents is that all of the other variables we just analyzed, marital status, gender, income, children, education, commute distance, cars, age, home ownership, taken together, those variables explain 9.26% of the variance and whether or not they purchased a bike. So using all those variables, we're still only explaining why under 10% of the people chose to buy a bike or not. So what is the other 90 plus percent accounted uh, to? So my, uh, my guess is that there's a lot of situational variables. When people are in good moods, they're more likely to buy a bike. 
when people are, uh, when an advertising is done well, when they walk into the store, they're more likely to buy a bike. If they have a poor experience with a salesperson, they're less likely to buy a bike. There's all these other variables which could account for why someone chose to either buy or not buy a bike that we're, we haven't measured, therefore we can't account for it. That doesn't mean that this analysis is of no value. If you can uh, improve your predictions by 9%, that's worth a whole lot of money to most stores. For example, Netflix recently um, created an open, um, an open project where they released in an API all of their Netflix data and said, if we can improve our predictions of what movies people want to watch by 2%, meaning when I click on a movie, if I can predict 2% better what other movies people would likely want to watch, that's worth a ton of money to us and we'll pay X dollars and it was a very big amount to anyone who can do this. So 9.26%, although small, is nothing to, nothing to laugh at. So we're going to ignore the rest of these for now. Down here we have our ANOVA table. Um, if you've seen the ANOVA video, this should be familiar to you. I'm going to change this to a number. So this is our p-value, our significance of f. And 0 0.00, it's less than 0 0.05. To interpret this, this simply means, I'm going to bold this number. This simply means that the, well, actually, I better give us at least some number here. Let me expand that. It's very low. There we go. Okay, this means that the uh, likelihood that these variables down here have no effect on whether or not they purchased a bike is 0.000000000798%. So it's extremely unlikely that these variables have no effect on whether or not, whether or not they purchased a bike. However, the ANOVA doesn't get into the differences between different variables and the effects they had. That's what this is for. Now down here in our regression analysis, I want you to pay attention to two things, the coefficients and the p-values. The rest of this is useful, but we're going to ignore it for now. Let's take these, turn them into numbers, and increase just slightly there. The uh, I'll give it a bit more room. There we go, our decimal places. So intercept. If you remember back to our um, our scatter plot, where we had a regression line of best fit or a line of best fit that went through the scatter plot, this coefficient for the intercept is simply marking where that line would pass through the x-axis. For example. Let me grab two variables. I'm going to use income and children. Select these, insert a scatter plot, and then I'm going to add a trend line through it. Okay, this trend line, although it may not look like it because a lot of the data here is overlapping, we're not seeing um, exactly how many dots are right here because they're all on top of each other. This is a regression line through the data. What this line does is it's taking the difference between each dot and the line and squaring that difference so that these differences down here are, are positive. So this difference down here is treated the same as the equivalent distance from up here. And it's adding up all those squared residuals, those differences between the trend line and the dot. This line then is the line that gives us the smallest sum of squared residuals. If this line would extend all the way through zero, that is the intercept. And our y equals mx plus b slope intercept formula, that's the that's the b. So over here in this data, let me scroll back up. This intercept is indicating that, so to speak, that b. And this p-value says it's significantly greater than zero. We often don't care about this intercept. This simply means that all these together are certainly having an, an effect. So we're going to ignore that for now. And instead, I want to look at each individual variable. So the great value of this analysis is that this negative 0.13, this is after accounting for the variance due to all of these other variables. Whereas a correlation table, it would show me the relationship between marital status and whether or not they purchased a bike, and it would ignore all other variables. Even though they're all on that table, it's ignoring everything else. But each of these variables, don't, they don't have an effect in a vacuum. They, they exist with all of these other variables. So these are what we call coefficients. So there's a formula for how this uh, regression turned out. We have a y, and it's equal to uh, x1, sorry, b1, x1, plus b2, 
b2 x2 plus, and each of the, this is representing each variable, v1 x1 is the coefficient for marital status times the value of a particular row of marital status. And we would have, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We'd have b1 through b9. That's the formula for y. I'm going to come back to this in just a second. So as we look through here, we've got these values. The negative sign here means that uh, as this changes from 0 to 1, they are less likely to buy a bike. The negative means it's a negative relationship. So let's take a look at our data. In this case, marital status, 1 equals married, 0 equals single. So as they change from single to married, it goes down, meaning they're less likely to buy a bike. Now let's move all the way over here to the p-value. This p-value is less than 0 0.05. Therefore, not only is this the effect, but this is a statistically significant effect, and it's unlikely that it's due to chance. However, come down here to gender. Much smaller effect of gender, which is also negative. So let's see which one is 1 in gender. In this case, female is 1. So what that means is as someone is female, or for females, they are, are slightly less likely to buy a bike because that's negative. However, come over to the p-value, this is far greater than 0 0.05. It's not statistically significant. This is a random effect. In other words, I would conclude that there is no difference between men and women on whether or not they purchase a bike. Okay, income, very small. Okay, if we keep going, there we finally find some numbers. However, look, the p-value is also very small. How is it possible that this tiny number is so significant? Well, let's take a look at the data. The values for income are huge. They range from zero to, or probably 10,000 to 170,000, or who knows, maybe more. Whereas something like marital status, gender, this is only ranging between zero and one. Therefore, this number is naturally going to be much smaller. I'll come back in my, my example down here to show you what I mean uh, in just a moment. So. Children, this is significant. It's below 0 0.05. Not significant, 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 and not significant. So what I want to do is take some of this data and try and ignore the fact that I know whether or not they purchased a bike. And then I want to see if I can predict and how accurately I would predict whether or not they purchased a bike. So I've got this formula, and I'm going to move this here to another cell. Let's go over here, actually. I'm going to paste it right here. And um, actually, what I want to do here, let's delete these. This y, our, de our dependent variable, is whether or not they purchased a bike. All right, I'm going to right align that. That's our y. And what I want to do over here is grab the coefficients for each of the significant variables. So down here, my first significant significant variable was uh, marital status. Let's move over here. I'm going to paste it right there. Now I'm cherry picking those that were significant. There, there are a, a bunch of reasons why I should or shouldn't do this that we don't have time to get into right now. For now, you should know though that if I were to remove some of these variables from the model, it would change the coefficients for the other variables because I'm changing the, 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 the correlations or the relationships among these independent variables. However, that's okay. For now, I'm going to take income next because that was significant. Let's paste it right here. Actually, let me move this down. I want to remember exactly what each of these were. This one was marital status, income. Let's give that one a bit more room. Uh, let's grab uh, children was significant too. Children. Let's go and get... Uh, Looks like not education, commute distance, and cars. Those are our other two significant ones. Commute distance and cars. Commute cars. Okay. What I want to do now is let's pretend I'm going to hide all this stuff. I want to pretend like um, I just went to a marketing firm, hide that, and I bought a bunch of data from them about people potential customers that I've never tapped into before. I'm going to hide all of this. Let's pretend like these are people that have never come to my store and I want to start a new marketing advertising campaign to target people who are likely to purchase a bike 
And these things are expensive. So I don't want to waste any money sending this mailer or whatever it is I'm doing to people who are unlikely to buy a bike. So I want to take this data set and I want to calculate the likelihood that each of these people would buy a bike. And it's based on these coefficients that I computed based on people that I already know whether or not they did or didn't purchase a bike. So I, once I calculate these coefficients, I can use them to predict the future. So what I'm going to do is take uh, these four variables, let's put them together. Um, I'm going to start by simply grabbing the first 10 of each. So there's that one, there's income. Let's grab children, commute distance and cars. Plug the data in. What I want now is a formula here that tells me if this is greater than or less than zero. So I'm going to use some product equals some product. I'm going to use this as array one. And the idea is then I use this as array two. Let's actually use F4 here on these so that it uses absolute values. Do not use absolute values on this formula, however, because now I want to be able to copy this down. Okay, so here's my Y predicted value based on the unique values of each individual person I just bought from that company. So last thing I want to do now is rank order the, or sorry, sort these. Grab this data, we're going to click data, sort. Make sure that uh, my data has headers is not selected. Sort by should then become column AE. Let's rank order it largest to smallest, hit OK. OK, what we can do now, let's say we have enough money to target half of our customers or half of the customers on this list. I've calculated their outcome variable, their the likelihood of purchasing a bike. I've sorted it from most to least likely, and I'm just going to simply cut them in half and grab the top half of the data to be the ones that I send my mailer to. And now I've I've maximized the potential that my uh, my targeted advertisement will reach those who are most likely to benefit from it and uh, convert those those advertisements into sales. So this is an overview of regression. In the next chapter, you're going to learn a much more sophisticated way of using regression for prediction by dividing the data set into a training and a validation set. Uh, for now, uh, this is how we do it in Excel.